time we're very excited to have as our guest one of the great drummers in contemporary music, certainly the most famous female drummer and percussionist in contemporary music, and so much more besides. Sheila E. Hi. Hello, Sheila. E for Escovado. Yes. And it's a musical family. It is. Um, what, your father was a percussionist, so was it inevitable that you would be? Well, that's what everyone thinks. I, yes, I mean, he still plays. Uh, congas, timbales, percussion. Grew up listening to him play. He practiced around the house every day. Um, during the week, he'd have a rehearsal with his band in the living room. And then on the weekends, they would have jam sessions. Oh. So, yeah, you would think that we would all pick it up. Um, but I really, I didn't think I was going to be a musician. That was not something that was that what I wanted to do when I grew up. It's like, I want to be the first girl astronaut. <laughs> that was the first thing. The second thing was to win an Olympic gold medal for running track. I was Gosh. a sprint runner. So I was actually training the, in the Olymp for the Olympics when I actually played this, one of the later shows, but one, a show with my dad when I was 15. That's when I knew at 15 that I should be playing music. Wow. Before then, I had no idea. But you must have been playing music the whole time. Only a little bit. Um, well, my first time playing uh, professionally, not really, but I was five years old. Right. I played with my dad with his band. Uh, the Escobedo Brothers, um, but I played in some local bands, but not till like 14. And again, I was playing soccer, running track, and I was very athletic. That's what I wanted to do, uh, be an athlete. But um, you know, during the day, sometimes you know, if my dad was practicing, he'd get off his percussion, and then you'd get on, play a little bit, and then go outside and play. So I didn't take it seriously at all. Really? But I loved music. I love watching bands, listening to bands. Sometimes um, living. In, in Oakland, California, we had so much great music there from Santana, The Grateful Dead, Sly and the Family Stone, Tower Power. You could go to any like local facility, community center, and we would catch the bus and sit outside and just listen to them play. Right. Yeah. So, did, I would have thought, I know, I know some people just think, well, it's drumming, you know, how hard can that be? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're making it sound like it was incredibly easy. But obviously, there's a lot to it. So, well, yeah. I mean, you know, to to be good at anything, you have to practice and play, and you know, practice and rehearse, and you know, do your best. And that was one of the things that I ended up not doing, which is kind of strange, odd. Uh, I know that God had given me the gift. I know that my dad, watching him, I think it was it was more like being a sponge and absorbing everything that he had played throughout. You know, the first 14 years of my life, I just listened to him play. Um, but when I started playing at 15, really started playing percussion, um, after a while, if you're playing every day, your hands hurt, they start bleeding, and then you don't want to touch the drum because it's so painful. Mm. But you love it so much, you're going to do it again. Uh, and there were times where, even playing with my dad and with George Duke, um, you know, my hands were so bad that I would sit, stand on the side of the stage before we got on and hit a brick wall just so I could numb my hands to play the first song. Gosh. Yeah, that was not fun, but I still loved what I did. Talk to drummers about this. Do you think any child can learn to play the drums or do some people have more innate rhythm than others? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Every single person on this earth has rhythm. They might not know where the one is, but they do have rhythm. But, you know, the first rhythm that everyone has is their heartbeat. That's rhythm that has to that has to happen in order to live. But everyone has a different kind of rhythm. And, um, yeah, some people, it might come easier to play drums. I mean, especially a, a, a drum set, a kit, because you've got your left foot doing one thing, your mm. right foot doing something else completely different. You've got your left hand, you know, in between, and your right hand. So to do all that, you know, when I sit down and play drums, I just do it. I, I play whatever I feel. If I start thinking about what I'm actually doing to break it up, it doesn't make sense to me at all. Right. And I mess up. I just like, no, I don't even want to hear myself. Let me just play. Let me close my eyes and just play what I hear should, what it should be. Because if I start breaking it down, it, it doesn't make sense to me at all. Right. No. <laughs>
I know it's crazy. I mean, you know, uh, while I've got you here, I'll ask another question. You know, how do drummers feel about percussionists? Because I think, you know, there's the, you see the drummer on stage, <laughs> and he's playing with his feet and his hands and everything, and then there's, you know, the percussionist by the side of the stage going, ding, chick, chick, <laughs> and getting, like, just as much <laughs> attention. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know what? Um, here's the thing. I am a percussion player who plays percussion on drums. Um, yes, it does... Uh, take sometimes a little less to play percussion, but it just depends on what you're going to play. The key to both instruments for me as far as playing drums and percussion is when not to play. And a lot of musicians don't understand it. It's any instrument really, but it's when not to play. So if you have a drummer that plays, he will at least play the same pattern for eight bars. That's a great thing. Nowadays, everyone wants to just play all over the place to be heard. But the way to play is to listen and to have a conversation. So if you're talking and I talk on top of you, we're not having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And musicians play like that sometimes. Someone's playing and they're playing all on top and it's like, who are we listening to? So it's the part of being able to sit down and say, hey, I'm going to play what needs to be played and, wh and it's when not to play. Percussion player is like, you're looking at a painting and there's a painting that's already done. And so I'm f trying to figure out what color am I going to add to that painting to make it okay, you know, and not mess up the painting. If I put the wrong color up there, it's going to be awful. So percussion players, we have to find those holes, those sweet spots where to play. If it takes uh, 82 bars to just play a triangle, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll wait the 82 bars to play the triangle, but it was the most beautiful triangle you've ever heard. <laughs> that means something, you know, but some people it's like, I need to play this now, and I need to play this, and I need to shake this. It doesn't have to be like that. It's like, why be at a place where you're not supposed to be or talk when you're not supposed to? That's how I look at it. Oh, very good. Do you think, so you, 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 what was it about that performance then at 15 that made you think, this is where I'm supposed to be? Um, well, my dad had this band called Azteca. They were signed to CBS. They were opening for Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, Temptations, and Stevie Wonder. So they were out on tour. They had an 18-piece band. And hit, my dad's percussion player got sick. When I sat in, well, when I played the show, first of all, he didn't want me to play because, like you say, at 15, he says, you know, you know nothing. You don't know anything at 15 years old. There's no way you're going to learn or know all this music. And we've been out on tour. And uh, so I said, no, Pops, I know the music. Can I just play? So long story short, I did. In that, that moment, like I had played with other local bands and, and things like that, only for like a year or two. But to play with a band that's professional, they're, you know, 10, 20, or 20 years older than me, 18-piece, um, the power of 18-piece band with horns and percussion players and singers, and, um, and then it raises the bar of where you have to be. Now, I was great with the local band playing with them, but when you go to that, you've got to rise to the occasion. So then there's 3,000 people there, and it's the most people I had performed in front of. And my dad gestures to me during one of the songs, play, uh, take a solo. And I looked at him like, I kind of, I mean, I play a solo, but like, I looked at him like, what do you mean? He's like, play from your heart. Okay. So I closed my eyes and I started taking a conga solo. Well, in the midst of that, it, in all my time of competing, you know, I get a high of running and beating and winning all the time. I want to win, I want to win. This was different. I was playing and... I just let myself go. I had no idea what I was going to play, and it felt like an out-of-body experience. I, all of a sudden, I'm not kidding, it was like I was looking down at myself playing, and it was the strangest thing. And when I was done playing the solo, I opened my eyes and I forgot where I was. I had no idea that I was sitting on stage where there were 3,000 people and I was with the band. I had no idea that I was there. It was almost like I blacked out. And when I opened my eyes and I, I started, I stopped my solo and I looked and the roar of the crowd, they got, they stood up in a standing ovation and, and I had chills from my head to my toe. It was, it was amazing and I just I wanted to cry. It was, it felt like it took all that I had emotionally to be in that place at that mm -hmm. time. And when that, after that was done and I looked at my dad and he looked at me and we kind of both te got teary eyed. And I went, we got off stage after the show, and he looked at me and I, and I said, I have never felt like this. And we hugged each other, we cried. And he says, I can't deny you what you already know. I had no idea. And I said, me either. I'm going out on tour with you. <laughs> That's what happened two weeks later. I went out on tour.
Never. Had a very successful session career, very young. Now, obviously you were well connected, but and obviously you were talented. Do you think being a woman in that business was a a big plus? Um, it, now it is. <laughs> <laughs> Back then it was a little bit challenging because right. um, my dad and my mom never said to me the whole time I, you know, sat around and played a little bit. You know that girls couldn't play and no don't play because you're a girl that was never said in our house but later on in hanging out with my friends and i go to the house and i say where's your conga drums where are your tim <laughs> where's your dad's timbales like what are timbales you know um and then as i started becoming that that session player traveling to los angeles and uh when from oakland to los angeles and and doing recordings i then got the weird sensation or weird feeling from other drummers and and bad looks and looking at me like what are you doing here oh you, uh you want to take our order you want uh, we want order some food i mean <laughs> you know can you take my laundry out i mean it was weird it's really just things are, and then it, it became uh oh okay well you're just here because you know so and so george duke billy cobham herbie hancock and then later on it was Oh, so you think you're better than me? And it was all that kind of stuff. Right. And I was when it first happened, I I was devastated. I was hurt. It was like all I want to do is play. I even felt bad taking money. It's like I didn't think that it was right for anyone to pay me a salary to play because I thought it was an insult because I loved what I what I got to do. I mean, it was so amazing. And to pay me to do that, I thought was wrong until my dad took me to the uh, <laughs> kitchen and said, "Hello, we need some food." You know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was a bit strange. Um, a lot of weird things being said to me, and my dad said, "You know, um, I think they don't feel as confident as you do. You do the homework. You make sure that when you go into a situation that you know it, what has to be done. You walk in with confidence because you've practiced." and you learned what has to happen. And when you walk in, it's like, you know, they might not have done the homework. So when you get ready to play, you play with at ease, you play at ease and it, you make it look simple. And he says, maybe it's not that simple for them. And I said, okay, well, I mean, many conversations like that. Um, I don't know that it made it easier. I know the first woman that I saw play drums was Karen Carpenter. And I was amazed because I, I, when I first saw her on television with her brother, mm -hmm. I said to my dad, um, Pops, I know she she has a television show and she plays drums. How come I don't have a television show? <laughs> I play just like her, don't I? <laughs> you know, and that was like I was I think I was nine or ten. George, you, Billy Cobham, um, you played with Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Well, what did you do with Marvin Gaye? I played percussion. That was also um, an uh, an or slash orchestra band. It was about twenty three of us. And we played my, I got my brother in the band as well. So there were three percussion players and a, and a friend of ours. Um, but it was interesting because Marvin Gaye, incredible. And when they asked me to be in the band, I was so excited. Um, and there's a cute little story that had happened during rehearsal. Um, it, this is when I learned when not to play. <laughs> the one conga drum, like I had three conga drums. We had double or triple of everything. There were like six, eight congas on stage three sets of timbales, it was huge, it was bigger than this room, just our setup. And we were playing what's going on, so the the conga beat for that, everybody knows that beat is dun dun ga, dun 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 da, mother, mother, right? Dun. There's far too many, so that's the beat. So I got to play, I was like, I get to play this with Marvin Gaye? <laughs> I started playing the beat, my brother was playing shaker and our other friend was playing tambourine. And I'm playing the beat, then we started dancing, and we started, oh yeah, this is good, this is good. And then I hit the other drum, dun dun ga dun ga dun ga boom, right? <laughs> I had an extra beat, because it just felt good, and I was playing, as like, woo! And with 23, 26 of us playing, Marvin is very soft-spoken, and he's singing a song, and then he said, hold on, wait! He never screams or yells at any, I've never heard him, but that one time, he yelled, he said, stop! He said, what? Someone played something extra. <gasps> and I'm thinking, I am in so much trouble. And I looked and I just turned red and I said, I'm sorry, I, I, my brother was, he got really excited. So I, I, <laughs> I'm just gonna just let you know, I'll take care of everything. I didn't know what to say and my brother went, 
Yeah, that was me. That was me. I was like, thank you. But that was all of that to be able to play in that band and play that conga beat, but learning again when not to play is a very good lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Being a woman playing for a woman, then, if there was that kind of what she's doing here. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Miss Ross, that's a little bit different. <laughs> Miss Ross. She's a friend, dear friend, no, Diana, yeah. But Miss Ross back then, it was a little bit different. And again, you learn what you have to do for that specific gig. So that gig was different because uh, the artist is different. So what she entails is she's on a stage. We were actually in a, in a venue that rotated in the round, and this was in the Bay Area as well. So she stood on the half of the stage, which rotated. The orchestra was in the pit. Um, but because I'm known in the Bay Area, as soon as they gave me a little solo and said my name, the, the, the applause were just as big as hers, and it was <laughs> not so nice, I guess, for her, she thought. Um, so that situation, I mean, it was a little bit different. Um, there were some things that were said from her uh, that I didn't like, so I quit the first day. Right. Um, and it was okay. It was but about, your it's about now. respect. Yes, yes, <laughs> we're good friends. Have you discussed that with her since? I don't know. And you know what? I don't know if she even remembers. Um, and that's okay, too. It's in the past. I thought it was funny um, because the next time I saw her was during the we are the world right and hi baby how are you so yeah that's my friend right, right. yeah because you were a star by then well i don't know i just think we all grow up and things change we look at yeah. things differently and you played with you were actually a a successful session player when you met prince who, mm -hmm. you, who you're later at a long association with but uh, but he was you, you were already at a career everything's going tell mm -hmm. me about how you met him then at the same place where, where Diana Ross was performing, it's a, pl a place where everyone came to perform. So uh, he was playing there, and I went to see him. I had heard about him already because my dad was uh, in Santana then, and they were in the same studio. And Prince came to the Bay Area because he loved the Bay Area sound, and he loved, uh, he wanted to be associated in that environment. He was inspired by the music. And he wanted to record in the place where Sly was recording. So Carlos was there as well with my dad. Um, so I later on met him at his concert there at the uh, this uh, venue, and then I went backstage to introduce myself because I wanted to meet him. And uh, when I he turned around to meet me, um, he just said, "I already know who you are," because I went to shake his hand. Hi, my name is, and he said, "I know you're Sheila Escovedo. I've been following your career," and he knew everything about me. So, um, and right then we exchanged numbers and and we stayed friends. You know, or we we met. I think it was in '78. Yeah. So did you, had you heard his music? Did you? Did, yeah. And was it obvious to you that this was a special talent? Because it took a while to bubble through to the rest of us. Uh, the only thing that I knew that was special wasn't that it was his music as much as before his record came out while he was recording his first record. My dad and the keyboard player then with Santana was Tom Coster. They were all in the studio and they were recording their record. So they said, there's this young kid next door He's playing all his, the instruments himself. There's nobody in there but him. He's producing it, he's writing it. And that was the thing, is like everyone talked about, he did this by him. Uh, one of the outstanding talents of, of popular music of our times. You were, um, you're on various albums and various things. You're coming around the sign of the times and Love Sexy. You were the musical director live of that absolutely incredible band. Thank you. Band. Um, but what's it like to play in an ensemble like that? I mean, those shows well, we were some of the best time. shows I've yeah. ever seen. No, we had a great time. Um, the time that I um, became uh, the drummer and the musical director was during Sign of the Times. And I chose to stop playing and be a solo artist because I felt like uh, something was missing in my life. And pl I ended up not playing as much and singing more. And I just felt like I wanted to play. So I was talking to him about it one day while I was out with Lionel Richie. And I said, you know what, I want to go back to playing. I want to just play music and not go out there and sing. Um, so I'm going to start looking for some other people to start playing with. And so I think a light bulb went on in his head like, uh, okay, I think I'm starting a new band. You want to play? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of happened like that. Um, so when that happened, I took half of my band and put it in his wow, band. Okay. And so half of my band was in the, in the Sign of the Times band. And a lot of my musicians that I use are mainly from church or from, and, and from the Bay Area, so they're all from the Bay Area as well. 
and then he had a couple of people that he used. So it was a combination of both bands. And uh, we had so much fun. You know, the cool thing about uh, Prince in recording with him is that, you know, the I would say the we call it the normal way, I guess, in recording. Most people would, if you have a bass track, there's only bass on the track. If you had a guitar, there's only guitar, or keyboard, there's only keyboard tracks. You only had, at, the, at that time, 24 tracks. But with Prince, he would overdub and punch in and different instruments on a track that should just have been one instrument, and it wasn't. And that was one of the things that made it different, challenging, um, but that's what made his sound. And with that being said, when you go to learn the song and find out and you pull that track up, you know, and you hear different instruments on that one track, well then where does that go and how do we play that, you know? So because I was one of the ones probably, I guess I was with him 99 nine percent of the time in the studio I knew where all the tracks were because most of the time I recorded him if he didn't record himself I punched him in on a lot mm. of that stuff so I was his engineer um, so I knew where those were and it, it it made sense for me to be the musical director so to be able to bring my band his band and then us learn the music well if we if they didn't know it um, and put that together and that energy we just had so much fun we just played constantly it was rehearsal and then in going into the tour, and then after the or during the tour, then playing the after parties, mm. and then going to the next city. It was nonstop playing. We had a blast. I know some of those after. I've seen some of those after shows, and you've seen this amazing show. And then you see it because it's open. He doesn't have to play the hits now. Right. It's like it could be a rock gig. It could be a jazz gig. Yeah. And yeah, amazing things happening on the stage. Yeah, and that's what's great is having the 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 different caliber of musicians that we had, we could play anything, you know. I think the only thing we didn't play was polka. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but that was before I, I started playing with Prince. Right, but the, the solo record came in 84, mm -hmm. 85. And it came after I was playing with Lionel Richie. And, and Prince approached me to say, hey, you know, you've been backing up so many people. Don't you want to just do your own record? And I said, well, kind of. And I said, but it'd be interesting because, you know, there's never been a woman timbali player and singer who would front her own band it's like that doesn't even that's unheard of and um i think it being that um that i couldn't look to someone to say hey maybe we should kind of look at this other artist there were no other artists as that we could look at so then i knew that we had something and um i said well yeah let's do the record so we did it did you enjoy Oh yeah, it. of course. I don't do it not unless I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. Um, we did the record pretty quickly because I had a couple of other songs I had written already. And um, during that time, he had one or two studios going at the same time because he was doing other projects. So Glamorous Life, basically, I want to say, I think we recorded that record in a week. That was mm, pretty quick. That was quick. Yeah. But that's the way you should do a record. If you go in and play live, why not? You know, you can get it done. I don't think it takes three months to a year to do a record. That's crazy. That doesn't make sense to me. Lots of live playing in the studio then. As opposed Always. To... Yeah, that's the best way. I love playing live. Do you, because you have a new record out. I do. Icon. Yeah. And do you record in the same way now? I did. I went back to Oakland and, and took my band and we set up in a room just like this in the studio and played together live like we should and had a great time. It was a lot of fun. Do, do, do you, you know, drumming has been changed by the drum machine, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and people record with drum machines, maybe they just add a little bit of live drums afterwards. Do you do that or do you? I do use drum machines once in a while, um, but this record I play drums on every, every song. Um, what I do do is um, when you're in a studio and you want to you know, if you wanted to add another artist or if you're using MIDI or you know, whatever. And Pro Tools, you want a lot of the times to have the music on the grid so in case something happens, you can, you know, look at that. So most of the time, everyone plays to a click. Um, my click, I hate the sound of a click. If anybody knows what that is, it's a, it's a, a, a thing. A timekeeper. That, timekeeper that's in click, click in your ears, right? It's the most annoying sound you ever want to hear. It is horrible. I don't know whoever thought of that, but the sound <laughs> of it is horrible. So what I do is whatever type of song it's going to be that I'm going to play, I actually um, 
put in uh, on my iPad there's this little app that I have and I, I create a percussion track that is actually my click track because I know I'm gonna play these parts after I'm done playing drums and that helps me to play the drum beat that I'm gonna play so it feels already lively like the percussion players always already playing with us so that's what I hear in my ears instead of that crazy click and that that just livens up the energy for me. I, I love it. Hmm. The click's an interesting thing because it, it changed drumming completely. I've I've talked to drummers about if you listen to some of the great drummers of the sixties, mm -hmm. you know, they chop their time changes all oh, the way the <laughs> wayward. And I'd say, are those drummers were they as good as we said? And they said, Well, they weren't playing with click, they just played right. in the It's a, in it's different hard. Way. And and as for some drummers it's hard to play the click because it makes them play rigid and it's like very stiff how do I you know how do you play like that well you have to still play like there's motion you have to do this while the click is going that's how you have to play and um, with a little bit of movement you know so it's so it feels real did you uh, what, what did you get out of being you know the singing star the glamour singing star at the front that you weren't that was different to what you were getting as the percussionist in a band well definitely it was different um, you know, playing percussion and with other bands and singing backup is what I did, and I was very comfortable. But then to stand in the front and do that, when I grabbed the mic after playing the timbales to walk across the stage, to, you know, you have to entertain, so you've got to figure out where you're going to be on either side of the stage. You know, I'd walk and I'd take the mic and I'd go, what do I do with this hand? Do I wave mm -hmm. at everybody? Or, you know, it was kind of weird. I had to. So what I would do is... Um, at my house, I would set up the timbales and the mic and stand in front of a mirror and record myself, videotape myself to figure out what was right, what felt right. Because if I didn't feel right, it didn't look right, then they wouldn't believe me. So I had to practice in the mirror to figure out um, until I felt very confident in what I was doing. And, you, and in the 80s there, in the midst of all this you were on, as you mentioned before, you know, one record that everybody knows with that has everybody on. We are the we are the world. Are you playing on that or just singing? Did you? No, I was singing. Um, we were still on the Purple Rain tour. We had All done right. American Music Awards that night, very successful. And then right after the show, we went to A and M Studios to record We Are the World. But I had been up for three days. We hadn't slept because we did one show traveling. We didn't have time to sleep. So when I went to do We Are The World, and I did it because Lionel and Michael and Quincy asked me to. Um, and they asked a lot, of course, everyone there, but when I showed up, I was so tired, and you see that I have my glasses on. If you look at the video, there's one time I'm standing there like this. I think I fell asleep. I was basically sleeping, standing up, so. Um, but what a great moment to be in the midst of all the people that I love, that, that musically, you know, Bruce Springsteen, I mean, everybody was there. It was amazing. Prince organization and went on your way and, and continued playing with lots and lots of people and doing all kinds of, of different and interesting things. Um, you've played with Ringo Starr, who's also, you know, a legendary drummer. Um, that's, that seems kind of odd to, you, to be a drummer playing with a drummer. What do you yeah. do with Ringo? <laughs> it, it is uh, very interesting. Um, it, it was pretty awesome. I mean, uh, when they first asked me to play, um, they reached out to me and they said, we would like for you to be involved in Ringo Star Tour in the All-Stars. I said, great. I said, so I'll be playing percussion, right? And they said, no, you're going to play drums. Well, you can play percussion, but you'll be the drummer. And I said, what, what is Ringo going to do? And they said, you're both going to play together. I'm like, oh my God, that's crazy. I, I was so excited. I mean, I think I was 9 or 10 when we saw the Beatles on television coming to America and I, I was screaming at the television just like ah, you know like I love the music and to be I never thought in a million years first of all even I mean I have a bucket list of things that I, I write down and and I check them off that was not even on my bucket list because mm -hmm. there's no way I thought of you know one day I could play with Ringo Starr that that's unheard of so to be able to play with him it was amazing so when I first met him he walked up to me and with his accent. Well, for me, it's an accent. For you guys, it's normal. No, it's an accent. Yeah. <laughs> and he folded his arms like this. And he looked at him. He goes, you are the drummer and don't you forget it. Just like that. And I went, okay, nice to meet you, <laughs> Mr. Ringo Starr. <laughs> you know? And um, so I said, okay. And he says, you know, make sure you're, you're ready to do this. I said, I'll be ready. 
So I went home and literally sat down and looked through every song that they had and, and wrote down, and this is a time that I really had to practice. I broke down every single drum beat that he had so wow. that I could play like him. And when I broke it down, I realized how difficult it was. Very challenging, uh, more amazing than I anticipated. Um, the simplicity of his playing and where he leads to do a fill is nowhere near what we would think would be normal. Uh, it's not normal. It was as if, I looked at it as this, um, anytime that they had a song, if Ringo wasn't the singer, instead of him singing a part or you know, a, a vocal, his vocal was really that other extra tom that he right. played. It was like a call and answer. And if you listen to it, you'll, you know, Paul will sing something or whatever, or John, and then he'll say something back with a tom fill. Mm. I'm like, that's brilliant, you know? And so I tried to learn how to play like him. And the first tour that we did, it was uh, Greg from Emerson, Lake and Palmer playing bass and some other guys. And so um, I was very confident when I met everyone in Canada and we sat down and I had my kit ready and I was like, I'm going to kill it, right? I sat down and Ringo looks at my drum kit and he says, "What? what's all that stuff that you have? <laughs> you know, and I said, well... I've got a couple of extra toms and some extra cymbals and there's an, an ex extension to my kick drum. And he says, why? And I said, well, you know, depending on the venues that we play, I can use that extension to give more bottom to my kick drum or less bottom. And he said, okay. So we started to play and he counted off. He goes, no, you count it off. So I counted off. I don't even remember what song it was, but I was like, <laughs> and I played so hard. And then in the midst, like not even eight bars, he just stopped and said, why are you playing so hard? And I said, because you said for me to come with it, so I'm ready. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> so we started playing, and he, he literally said that it was the most fun he had ever had, and it forced him to bring his game. I'm like, you can't say that because you are the man, you know. I was so humbled to play with him, just honored, and what a great guy he is. And to hear the, the stories about the Beatles, I wish we could sit here and tape. Mm. It was amazing stuff that I heard, and just I was in awe. It was wonderful. Because, you know, uh, we were just talking before, and I mentioned Stephen Stills. There's some, you know, such an amazing guitarist. You're like, I played with Stephen <laughs> Stills. I, I've got a feeling I'd be saying anybody's name, and you're going to be throwing. I've played with. Oh, them. Not really. <laughs> you did. Um, to do some musical direction for you know one of the big stars of m the modern times, Beyonce. Mm -hmm. So what's she like to work with? Oh, she's a blast. I really respect Beyonce. I really do. Um, she reminds me of me as well as Patti LaBelle and the women that r I see physically, see work hard, mentally, really figure out what they have to do in order to um, really put on a fantastic performance. And Beyonce puts in the work, no doubt. I mean, she comes in there, she practices, and she's ready to go, and she knows exactly what she's going to do. And it does. she doesn't take it lightly. I mean, she really does work hard. And that worth eth ethic has put her in the place that she is now. Absolutely. But you've made your own album again. It's been a lot, quite a long while. Very long time. Twelve years, I think. At least, the, yeah. The last album. Um, what made you want to get back out there with your your own stuff well I never really left it's just I like being behind the scenes like some of your directors and producers here yeah. I like being over there as well I love producing and directing and uh, I'm doing a lot of projects like that um, musical directing even for people and not going out on the road but putting the bands together for the groups um, I'm not the person that has to be in the, the limelight I don't have to um, I choose not to and I enjoy that just as much but I was writing my autobiography that's coming out next year. And in the midst of writing that, there were some things that were said that I said, you know what, this could be a song. <laughs> and I went, wait a minute, I should talk about this. I should write about it. Wait, I should do a record, you know, right in the middle of it. And so um, that's how this record came about. And um, I'm glad that I did it. It was the perfect time. And then when I realized, I looked back and I said, you know, I really haven't done a record in a long time. I want to do... I would call it a another Sheila E record because I've done some jazz records, Latin jazz, um, a smooth jazz, a Latin record, 
And this is a, to me, another Sheila E. record that I haven't done, so it's been a long time. It's very radio friendly, but it represents all the 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 faces of E. I mean, I have a lot, <laughs> meaning the different genres of music that influenced me while growing up. And uh, it's got a little bit of everything, and I have a lot of great special guests. Even Dave Stewart and Judith Hill, they wrote a song for the record. So uh, I'm really excited about it. I had a great time doing it, and I'm really proud of it. Lots of drumming on it. Lots of drumming, absolutely. Um, you know, and that was purpose, purposely done because um, I, people keep saying to me, we haven't seen you in a long time, and I said, I haven't gone anywhere. So what I did on this CD, I opened up the, the CD with me playing a conga solo, just to remind you that I still do play. And the great thing about it is that all my solos on this record, from conga solo to mollies to my drum solo, um, every solo that I did, I didn't punch in any solos one take that was it because that's what I do live if I couldn't play the solo once then you know I do that while I'm playing live I don't stop the band and say hey hold on a minute and explain to the audience excuse me can I do this solo again because I messed up I purposely on every song that I took a solo one take no punches now most guitarists I know collect guitar you know, mm -hmm. they never get rid of a guitar and, and they end up with hundreds and hundreds of guitars. How are you with drums? Um, I used to have <laughs> about, yeah, I don't know, maybe 11 drum sets and probably 15 congas and 10 timbali sets and, and then just a room full of just uh, stuff that I, I collected throughout Africa or, I mean, not Africa, I didn't go there, but buying it that had come from Africa, Brazil, uh, Peru, wherever. Um, and so then at one point I just said, this is too much. I mean, I've got five garages, warehouses full of stuff, so I've got to get rid of it. So I did. I gave a lot to kids. I just gave it to, you know, upcoming artists that want to play, wow. to schools. I donated. And then instead of the drums, I collect shoes instead now. Oh, so well, these just... are very nice shoes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so it's shoes for me now. Well, Sheila, it's been amazing having you on Needle Time to talk about all the amazing people you've played with and your wonderful new record, Icon. So it's Sheila E on Needle Time.